Good morning, Raymond South Coast Family Church. It is such a joy to be in your home or wherever you're listening from today. Welcome, and we are at your service. Today, before we dig into the Word of God and we allow the Holy Spirit to reveal Christ to us, let's take a moment, lift up our hands, lift up our hearts before the Lord in a time of praise and worship.
morning. We thank you for your faithfulness and that we can stand in awe of you this morning because you watch over your word to perform it. And it will not return void, but will accomplish that which you please. So we give you praise in the house this morning. We give you thanks for your amazing love. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a good praise in the house today. So just before we dig into the word, maybe you watching for the first time, or maybe you're a regular and you want to just sow a seed of finances into our ministry, into the vision God's given us, you can go to rfcfc.com and you can find our banking details there if you want to do an EFT. Or you can simply use the SnapScan code that is appearing on your screen right now. If you have any problems, send us a WhatsApp or an email and we should be glad to help you. Thank you for your generosity. Now, just a few things. Remember, uh, church is open. We have two services every Sunday, 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock. They are one-hour family services, but our children's church is open. But you need to reserve your child's place before 12 o'clock each Friday so we can adhere to the COVID regulations. If your children do not get in, bring them to the service. It's not a problem at all. And then remember, our online service premieres children's church or kids' church at 8 a.m. and the adult service at 9 a.m. Now, over Christmas, we will be having a Christmas service on Christmas morning at 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock. There'll be no children's church. It is just a family service. It's always a lot of fun. So come along and let's worship and celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior. Then, because of the COVID regulations and the curfew, we will be not having uh, our midnight service seen in the new year for this year. But what we will be doing is we will do an online service that will premiere at 8 p.m. on Friday the 31st, and it will be on demand from then. So you can sit with your family wherever you are and see in the new year with us as we partake of the word and of the communion. God bless you, and let's dig into the word this morning. Now, we're busy with a series called Christmas 2021 Advent, and our theme today is the peace of God. God's peace causes you and I to enjoy the benefits of heaven here on earth. It's so interesting that in 1903, Andrew Carnegie founded the Peace Palace and its Peace Library at The Hague in the Netherlands with a gift of one and a half million dollars. Now in today's economy, it would be the equivalent of $47 million or 750 million rand. This was an effort on his part to inspire world peace. Well, 120 years later, we know the outcome. It was not successful. And here's one of the reasons, perhaps. If you go to their website today and you search the word Bible, you'll get two random hits, none of which are related to the Bible or to God in any way. You see, they have a library that's devoted to peace, but not a single mention of a Bible, a scripture, or the acknowledgement of God, or of the greatest book that was ever written on the subject of peace. You see, the conclusion of the matter is that true peace will always be elusive until you meet the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's only Christ's peace that brings a wholeness and a calmness and a confidence into our lives that we need during a time of adversity. Turn with me today to 1 Peter chapter 1, and let's have a look at a few verses that really unpack this for you and I this morning. In 1 Peter, sorry, in 2 Peter chapter 1, from verses 1, it says, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Notice, Peter addresses this to those who have like precious faith. If you're a believer in Jesus, if you've received the righteousness of God, 
This letter is written to you. Then in verse 2, he says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. Notice something really significant. Grace and peace are increased or multiplied into our lives only when we receive the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. That knowledge there is not just a head knowledge, but it's an experience of knowledge. Where you, when you experience the love of God in your life and salvation, it comes with the package of God's amazing grace and peace. He goes on in verse 3 as he unlocks certain aspects and principles and he says, as his divine power has given to us everything that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you might be partakers of his divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. You see, we learn from this that his divine power is available to you and I in our daily lives, in every area. Not just always a spectacular power, but that supernatural power that makes the difference even in little areas. And notice, it starts off by us receiving or having the grace and the peace of God multiplied in our lives. Now, when I say it's not always spectacular, but sometimes supernatural, it's important we understand the role that peace plays in receiving from God. Do you remember in 1 Kings chapter 19, where Elijah was being revealed, where God was revealing to Elijah who he was? He never came through the earthquake. He never came through the fire. All those spectacular things came and went, and God was not in them. And then it says, but he was in the still, small voice. You see, and that speaks to you and I. It's that when we're living and abiding in peace, that we are best enabled to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. So as we grow in Christ, we experience him and his grace, his peace is increased and multiplied in our lives. Now, remember, peace is one of the fruit of the Spirit. Because it's a fruit of the Spirit, it means that it can be grown and it can be produced or developed. This means that God wants you and I to apply the peace of God to our lives and to our relationships. Peace is also listed in Ephesians chapter 6, as one of the vital pieces of the armor of God that we're to wear as believers, which means that peace is to be employed in spiritual warfare. You know, the devil cannot manage a Christian who walks in peace because he himself doesn't have or know what peace is like. In fact, the Bible tells us in Matthew 12, verse 43, that he and evil spirits are seeking and walking around on this earth or in the spiritual realm, seeking rest, but they never find it. In other words, in spiritual warfare, it is so vital that you put on your gospel shoes of peace because, you see, during times of war, soldiers value their boots because it keeps their feet healthy, and so they are able to take the right steps that they need to take. That's what the peace of God enables us to do. This means when life takes an unexpected turn, we are able to hold our peace and allow the Lord to direct us. And when he does, the results are always amazing. So today, let's take a few minutes And let's review some powerful statements about peace and how they can impact us. Number one, peace is a posture and a position that you and I take up in Christ. I was so blessed this past week as we met for our monthly prayer meeting with the men, with the ladies, and then corporately. And in all of them, 
there were some amazing scriptures and promises that came through that really confirmed to you and I the importance of the peace of God in our lives. Let's have a look firstly at 2 Corinthians chapter 20, verses 17 and 18. It says, you will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourself, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed down before the Lord and worshipped him. You see, when you're in the right position and the right posture, the battle belongs to the Lord, but the victory belongs to you. The second powerful statement about peace we want to review today is this. Peace enables you to stand still in the rest of God. We find this in Exodus chapter 14, verses 13 to 16. It says, And Moses said to the people, again, notice, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. For the Lord will fight with you or for you, look at this, and you will hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward, but lift up your rod and stretch your hand over the sea and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry land through the midst of the sea. So we see that when we stand and we rest in God, He's able to speak to us and give us the direction and the clarity we need to make healthy, wise decisions for our lives. Thirdly, the third powerful statement we want to review today is this. Peace enables you and I, after we've stood still, to know that we're walking forward in the peace of God once we've made a decision. In other words, we could say it like this. Walking in peace becomes a gauge as to whether you are really trusting God or you're trusting in yourself or in other things. Have a look at Isaiah 30, verse 15. It says, For this says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and confidence will be your strength, but you would not. I love the way it connects returning and rest around the peace of God because the word returning speaks about repentance. So it actually speaks about that when we recognize that we're not in the peace of God, we need to return to it. We need, we need to come back into the peace of God. And when we're in the peace of God, we're able to rest and we're able to receive and partake of the salvation that God has got for us. And with that comes a quietness and a confidence in our lives. You see, walking in peace produces wholeness in our heart and in our souls. And it starts to transform the environment and the atmosphere around me. And so what happens is, as I walk in this peace, it becomes a situation where I can impact and influence those around me and the world I live in. When you submit to the peace of Christ and you let the calm enter into your inner person, then you will have a calming influence on those around you because of the peace of God that's flowing out of your heart like a river. I remember this past week experiencing exactly that. We were busy uh, finalizing a, the sale of a family home here in Ramsgate, and I was uh, busy negotiating the people we were going to move in that had bought the property. We were moving other people out, and they'd given us, we'd given them a time that they could move in. And they arrived three hours early. Can you believe it? And so this put us in a situation where they had all their trucks ready to move in. We were still trying to move out and clean the place. And so I said to the person, I said, listen, you're welcome to move in, 
But you need to understand the house isn't going to be clean. Everything's not going to be in order because you're too early. They accepted that. I need to find out later in the day that they were moaning at the agent because the place was left untidy. And he phoned me and he said, aren't you going to send people to clean? And I started to get on my high horse. I was ready to do battle and I was going to just tell them what for. And you know, while I was speaking to this person, Mandy sitting across from me just lifted up her hand and she just said, Larry, stay calm. And you see, she had an influence on me. And so I didn't quite get onto my high horse before I got off. And I just said to this person, listen, give me 15 minutes. Let me just calm down and think about it and I'll phone you back. You see, because I was able to maintain peace, and walk and, 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 and create that environment around me. What happened is this. By the time I calmed down and Manny and I discussed it, we realized regardless of how we felt, we wanted to finish the season well. So I phoned back with a solution. And you know what had happened? It had already been solved. Because this person who had suddenly panicked when they saw all the work that was to be done had realized their mistake. And so you know what? We were able to come up with a healthy compromise that was a win for both of us. It's Jesus who gives you and I the ability to remain in peace in response to angry words. Our next statement that we want to review today is this. We can also tune into the peace of heaven through the power of prayer. Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, you remember that story? He arrived there. He was overwhelmed and gripped by the momentum of the occasion, by the pain of the occasion, about, uh, uh, around about what he was about to go through. And he said to his disciples, I need to go forward and pray. I need to get into my prayer closet. And he pressed through that anxiety and, 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 the, and the anxiousness of that moment. And we understand what he was about to face. And during that time of prayers, he cried out to his father. We know that God heard him, but he never got the answer he wanted, but he received what he needed. He walked into the peace of God. And remember, after praying and finding his disciples asleep, he came out and he was completely in peace and he was ready to face the storm. You see, when our flesh is weak, our spirits are made strong through prayer until we walk into that place of peace again, we might not be able to do it on ourselves in our, in our own ability, but in Christ, we can do all things. And you know what happened? Jesus walked out. He looked at his disciples with absolute calm and peace, and he said, come on, it's time to go. And as they were walking out, the soldiers and the Pharisees came to capture and arrest Jesus. And in that moment, Peter got caught up in, in the anger and, the, and, and, and wanted to protect Jesus, and he chopped off the ear of one of the soldiers. Man, I would have loved to have been there. You know what Jesus did? With absolute peace and calmness, he bent down, he picked up the soldier's ear, and he simply put it back on his head, and instantly the soldier was healed. I mean, if I was there that day as a soldier, I would have been out of there like this because I would have realized there's something about this person that is definitely supernatural. Anyway, Jesus put it back, and he looked at Peter and he said, Peter, be calm, be peaceful. If I wanted to defend myself, I could command legions of angels to come right now to my aid and to my defense. But I'm here for the will of God. And he made it so clear that he wasn't being arrested. He was laying down his life. That's what peace will do. And we can arrive at that peace through prayer. Have a look at Philippians chapter 4. Uh, and verses 6 to 8. It says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses your understanding, will guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, good, of good report, if there's anything virtuous or anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. You see, when the peace of God is ruling in your life and it's guarding your mind and your heart, you're able to meditate on the right things and so your life stays 
in the track and momentum that it needs. So let's take this a little bit deeper and let's start asking ourselves a couple of questions. The first question which I found very interesting and this has really helped me is, what do I do when I find myself in a place where my peace, that peace of God is missing or absent? Now let's remember, to have peace does not mean the absence of problems. It means in the midst of your greatest challenge, you remind yourself that you know the greatest problem solver that ever lived, and he is on your side. Colossians 3 verse 15 says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you have been called in one body, and be thankful. In fact, when you walk in peace, you're unconsciously allowing the Holy Spirit to lead you. You don't have to be smart to follow the plan of God. Often, the Holy Spirit would lead you by the presence of peace or the absence of peace. So this is what I've learned. Three things about the absence of peace. Number one, God uses the absence of peace very often in our lives as a warning or as a caution. So if your peace is scratchy or you're missing your peace, it probably means that God is trying to say something to you. Be cautious or think carefully about the decision you're about to make. Number two, the second thing I've learned about the peace of God is this, is that when you have an absence of the peace of God, God often uses that to draw you and I into a place of prayer. Remember we just studied earlier, prayer empowers the peace of God to be released in our lives and it helps us to get into our position and change our posture. Number three, God often uses the absence of peace to reveal to you and I that we might be out of alignment with his will for our lives. He might use that absence of peace to bump us and nudge us to say, listen, Larry, you're not where you need to be. You're not walking where I want you to walk, and you're going to miss out on the best I have for you. So God will use that to nudge us back to the place where we're centered again in the peace of God. The next interesting thing I want to share with you is, and encourage you with today, is don't give up or forfeit the peace of God easily in your life. You know, in John 14, 27, Jesus actually made this statement. He says, I bequeath my peace to you, not as the world gives, but as I give. In other words, the word bequeathed actually means he gave it to us as a personal inheritance. It goes on in Isaiah 53 at verse 5, and it says this, but he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we were healed. We need to remind ourselves often that Jesus actually went to the cross, he went to the grave, and he defeated all of hell so that you and I could walk in that peace that he's bequeathed to us. Now, this is sometimes how we give up that peace that God has given us. Number one, when we choose to walk in the flesh, and not in the spirit, we're very often also deciding to let go of the peace of God in our lives. Number two, we surrender or forfeit our peace when we make a decision to leave areas of our lives unsurrendered to the protection and the love of God. It's so important that we daily walk in a place of confessing and living in God's presence. Number three, We can forfeit our peace sometimes if we decide or if we leave unresolved issues and unforgiveness to live in our lives. It will steal the peace of God from our hearts. And number four, when we decide not to deal with things or do things in the right time. It's so important that we learn and grow in this area to do things at the right time. When we don't, we often end up forfeiting our peace and we end up getting frustrated and worked up at the circumstance 
But it really comes back to you and I not managing our time well and doing things when we're supposed to to do them. Then finally this morning, I want to remind you as well that we must also grow in a place where we make sure that we don't allow the devil to steal our peace. Now remember, the previous point was we can forfeit our peace on our own. This point is we mustn't let the devil steal God's peace from us. And I want you to know he loves to steal the peace of God from the life of the believer. Here are some of the things that he can do to steal that peace. He works over time at keeping you and I in the place of guilt and condemnation. And you know, when we give in to guilt and condemnation and we stop seeing ourselves as the righteousness of God, he drives a wedge into our relationship with Jesus and we feel unworthy. And when we get to that place, it, it robs us of our peace and our confidence. Number two, what the enemy does is he sows thoughts of lack and insecurity into our lives and it leads us down the path of anxiety. Very often worry and fear is what follows. And when we get caught up in worry, and you can go study Matthew chapter 6, in your own time this week, it speaks, Jesus spoke and addressed worry and fear in such a powerful way, it'll automatically steal the peace of God from your heart. And another way that the enemy, the devil, will steal or try and steal the peace of God is he'll get you to question the word of God. He'll get you into a place where he questions the word or he'll cause you to reason out whether you're actually hearing from the Holy Spirit or not. And what happens is it ends leading you down the path of doubt and unbelief. And doubt and unbelief will rob you of your peace and your confidence. Here's the thing. Don't let him steal your peace. So today as we close, I want to take a reading from Romans chapter 14, from verse 17 down to verse 19 out of the NLT second edition. Listen to what it says. When we start to walk in these areas, when we start to put up our gospel shoes, we start to recognize the power of the peace of God that has been given to us as our inheritance. Look what it says in verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what you eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. But look at verse 18. It says, if we serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God and others will approve of you as well. So then, let us aim for harmony. Let us aim for peace in the church and do our best to build each other up. Let's work together during this festive season as we go into the new year. And let's keep the peace of God, not just strong in our own lives, but strong in the lives of those around us. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you've given us your peace, that Jesus went to the cross. He went to the grave so that we could walk in your beautiful peace. And so today I pray for myself. I pray for everyone that's under the sound of my voice. And I ask, Lord, that you'll cause the peace of God to rule and reign in our hearts again. If the areas where we've let go or we've allowed the enemy to steal our peace, we thank you right now that we claim it back in the name of Jesus. And we put on those gospel shoes of peace. We lift up that shield of faith that will help us to maintain our peace. And I thank you right now that a perfect calmness will guard our hearts and our minds in union with you. Perhaps you're here today and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. I would love to lead you in this prayer of salvation. If you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life, would you simply pray this prayer out aloud from Romans chapter 10, 8 to 10, and just believe it in your heart. Say, Father God, I believe today that Jesus is the Son of God, that He died on the cross, and that you raised Him from the dead for me so that I could be saved. I accept and acknowledge and receive Jesus into my heart as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Well, if you prayed that prayer today, 
please send us a WhatsApp or an email. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to send you a Bible and a beautiful booklet that will help you to make the right decisions as you begin your journey in serving and being a follower of Christ. It's a great decision you've made and we'd love to hear from you. Perhaps you're listening today and you have a prayer request. You have a need you want to share with us. We'd love to pray with you. Or perhaps you have a testimony and you'd like to share what God has done in your life through these uh, teachings or through what God is doing as you study and grow in your walk with God. We'd love to hear from you. So God bless you. Don't forget to join us on the 25th for our special Christmas service, which will premiere online at 9, p 9 a.m. And then don't forget our New Year's service will premiere at 8 p.m. God bless you. We love you. And we can't wait to see you soon.